Hi, my name is Steven. And I'm Martin. And this is the very first talk of the Game 2023 conference. Well, to be accurate, it's actually a re-recording because we had some sound issues, but we'll definitely try to be just as enthusiastic as we were on the day itself. In this particular talk, we are going to first tackle the algebraic aspects of geometric algebra. And there's a good reason to do that because you have GA talks coming for you all week long and they will all sort of assume that you know the basics that we are going to be talking about right now. So we'll be talking about the geometric product, the basis and so on, all those, all those basic things. So what is geometric algebra? It is an alternative to vector and matrix algebra, which is ideally suited amongst many other things for computer geometry. In a bit more of a mathematical sense, it is an algebra on a graded linear space with an invertible product that operates on multivectors. And what are those multivectors? Well, they are a direct sum, which is a mixed bag of the scalars, the real numbers you already know and love, the vectors, which you should also already know, and then some new objects called bivectors, which are just like vectors, but then two-dimensional, and you have trivectors and so on, all the way up to the pseudo-scalar or the PSS. What we will do today is uh, start by giving you sort of the basic calculation rules, like think of it as, as explaining the, the matrix matrix product but then for geometric algebra and in order to do that we will need some new numbers and we are going to ask the question why would we actually want some new numbers furthermore we also want to know exactly which new numbers we're talking about and how we should actually use them and then we'll end this talk talking a little bit more about k vectors and constructing a Cayley table or a multiplication table just to make sure that you guys really understand the basics of what we're going to be using for the rest of the week. Let's get started. We'll need some new numbers and that's not the first time in history. In fact, we've been through this phase quite a few times in history and one of the first interesting cases to look at is that of a Persian mathematician called Karizmi. That's his full name. I'm not going to try to pronounce it and this is the name of his book. I can't even read that. Right? But what I can do is in this uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, European version of the same title, you notice this cyan word algebra. And that's because this is the book that gave us the word algebra. Um, exactly in its title, it actually also gave us the word algorithm. So this was a very, very influential book in mathematics. This is actually the translation of the title, the Compendium's book on calculation by completion and balancing. But what was the book about? Well, it was about the quadratic equation. In fact, this was the book that presented the first complete solution to the quadratic equation. And it did, did it in quite a different way than that you might have learned how to solve a quadratic equation. And so I thought it was a good idea to highlight one of the proofs in the book which solves this particular case. So x squared plus 10x equals 39. And it does so by recognizing that x squared is actually a square. It's a square with two sides of x. And 10x is a rectangle, one side of 10, one side of x, and we're actually going to break it up into two pieces. So we get one piece of 5 by x, and we get another piece of 5 by x, and we know that the total area of all the pieces we've drawn so far is 39. But we can also see this obvious missing piece, right? There's this uh, part that we could add to complete the square, which is actually the name of this method, completing the square. And it's quite clear that we need to add this uh, uh, part of 5 by 5 to complete the square. So we need to add in 25. That means that we also need to add in 25 to the right hand side, getting 64. And we've made the square of this entire thing. So all we need is now, all we now need is the square root. So x plus 5 squared equals equal 64. And we can easily see that x equals 3. Or, of course, minus 13, but we're going to ignore that negative solution. And that's okay, because Karizmi also ignored the negative solution. Um, and actually, he didn't just solve this one problem that we looked at right now. He solved six different problems. But wait a minute, why are there six equations? We just have one quadratic equation. Well, the reason that Karizmi had to solve six different problems is that he didn't know what negative numbers were, nor did he have the number zero. So if you, for example, look at this first one, ax squared plus bx equals c, which is the one we solved, and we set b to zero, 
then we just get this case and so on you can do sort of the same thing for all of the other cases setting things to zero or bringing things to the other side and then you realize that this is all really just the same equation but Karizmi didn't see that he had six times as much work and so the lesson here is if you add in some new numbers then you might be saving yourself a lot of work right he could have proven the entire quadratic equation and its solution on a single page instead of write a complete book with six different cases completely worked out and that of course leads us to a new question are there any other numbers uh, that that could help us to make things a lot simpler and that is in part what geometric algebra is about and to go hunting for those numbers we could first ask the question what would uh, Karismi have had to do in order to find these numbers and not uh, walk into the trap of having to prove six different statements that were really the same well he could have looked at this simple equation right if he would have studied x plus one equals one for a little bit longer then surely he would have discovered that x needed to be zero right and if he would have studied this equation x plus one equals zero then surely he would have discovered the negative numbers and he could have saved himself a lot of work so we are going to do sort of the same thing we're not going to look at these equations we're going to look at a different equation the one we're going to look at is this one x squared plus one equals zero so that's another quadratic equation and obviously we're still not looking at it the way that we typically learn how to look at it these days we're going to look at it with the method I showed you earlier. So x squared plus 1 equals 0 means the square and the square equals the square. Now, of course, the solution to this equation is rather obvious. x squared needs to be minus 1. And that poses a problem because we don't have any real numbers that square to minus 1. But let's just be honest with ourselves. What can we observe here? Well, we can observe here that we have this edge and this edge apparently isn't a real number and we know that because this edge squares to minus one right so let's just let's just invent a number like that let's call it red e and red e has the property that it's not a real number it's the edge of a box so i'm pretty uh, okay with accepting that it's not a real number and it squares to minus one now of course if this e isn't a real number then we have really no reason to assume that this e would be a real number even though we have real numbers that square to plus one, we're still talking about an edge. So let's just introduce this green E. This green E is also another real number, squares to plus one, and similarly the blue E here will square to zero. These three numbers, we'll call them the geometric numbers, are actually going to be super fundamental to everything in geometric algebra. In fact, they're so fundamental that if you know how many of each of these types of numbers you have, you know exactly what geometric algebra you're talking about and we write it down like this so you have your base field the real numbers those are the type of numbers that your coefficients have and then you will get p of these green guys q of these red guys and r of these blue guys and that will completely determine the geometric algebra and all of the algebraic relations all of the rules that you need to know completely determined by these three numbers p q r which we call the metric of the uh, the metric signature of the geometric algebra and it defines how many generators which are the e guys you have and what their squares are so let's look at some examples so one of the easiest geometric algebras is if you just take let's say three of these p guys right so in that case we get three e's e1 e2 and e3 and all of them will square to plus one and we write it as r subscript 3. So q and r are 0, and then you don't really need to specifically write it down. Another example would be r13. That's also going to be very important in a number of talks that are coming, and Martin will give you some more details in a minute. Um, this is algebra is actually called uh, the space-time algebra. Um, and it has this e1 that squares to plus 1, and then it has e2 and e3 and e4 that all square to minus 1, and this one will represent the time, and the other ones will represent the spatial dimensions. Another very important algebra for us specifically this week uh, is called PGA, um, and the signature is 301. Um, so you have three guys that are positive, one guy that is negative, and in this particular case, if you have one guy that is negative, 
it is sort of customary to call it E0. So E0 squares to 0, and E1, E2, and E3, they all square to plus 1. And this is the sort of most important rule, we call it the contraction action of geometric algebra, which just says you have a number of these uh, generator uh, elements, all called EI, they're not real numbers, but their square is going to be either 0, 1, or minus 1. And we will use these special numbers to model vectors, points, circles, lines, planes, translations, boosts, rotations, screws, spheres, and many, many, many more things. Um, and we'll be getting into a little bit of that uh, in all of the following talks. So this is our first very important rule called the contraction algebra uh, axiom, and it just says that you have these generators and they're not real numbers and they square to a real number. So what we will do with them? Well, we might use them to write down vectors, and I'll show you how that works. So we'll start with this one basis vector, and we call it E1. We'll take another basis vector, and we call it E2. And then, of course, just as in linear algebra, we can basically create any other vector by taking linear combinations of E1 and E2. Right, so that's that's a vector x, for example. Now, what you need to realize is I could have chosen this vector um, to be my e1, yeah. But that means that just as e1 squares to a real number, we also will require that any vector, any x, any linear combination of these basis vectors will need to square to a real number. So let's work that out and see what that means, right? So we're basically saying that alpha e1 plus beta e2, when squared, needs to be a real number. If we work it out, we get alpha squared e1 squared, beta squared e2 squared, and then we get the cross terms, alpha beta e1 e2 and alpha beta e2 e1. So let's look at this. Alpha squared, alpha beta, and beta squared are obviously real numbers, right? e1 squared and e2 squared are also real numbers because of our contraction action. So we basically know that all of these guys are real numbers. But remember, we need this entire thing to be a real number. And the only way that that can happen is if this part is zero, right? So these need to go away. Um, and that means that E12 equals minus E21. So this follows directly from the contraction axiom. And it basically says, if you have a generator, then its square is a real number, and if you take the product between two different generators, it anti-commutes, right? Those are really the two fundamental rules that you need to know about in geometric algebra. If you need to know about these two guys, then you can pretty much do all of the calculations that you're going to need this week. Now, of course, there is much more to say about this. And so one question that should immediately pop up is what is this E12 element? And this product of E1 and E2, we often write it uh, like this, with subscript 1, 2, uh, just because it's less work. Yeah. Um, but what is it? Well, we already know that alpha E1 plus beta E2 was a vector. So it's sort of an oriented length, right? What E1, 2 will turn out to be is a called a bivector. It's the product, the outer product, actually, of two vectors. And what it represents is an oriented area. Now, what I need to point out here is you're seeing an animation here. And in the vector part, you're seeing a different vector at each frame, right? These are all different vectors, all pointing in different directions. But what you're seeing here is the same by vector over and over again. And that is because the by vector is the amount of area and the plane that it's in, right? So this is really this, this is all different vectors. This is always the same by vector. And it's actually even worse. This is also always the same by vector because it happens to have the same area and it lies in the same plane. So it's the same by vector, right? So the by vector really is this oriented two dimensional area. And it doesn't stop at by vectors actually. If we throw in a third vector, then yes, exactly, you get a tri vector and it represents an oriented volume. And again, there are many different pictures I could draw here that would represent the same uh, tri-vector, right? So let's do a few exercises just to make sure that we all get how the algebra works. So the, the product we're using here and we've defined here is actually called a geometric product. So it's it is written with juxtaposition, so I'm not writing any operator for it, but obviously this is a product here, right here. 
Um, there's a product right here and so on. So let's do the first exercise. The addition still distributes over multiplication just as you're used to. So you can do E1 times E1 minus E2 times E1. And then typically we can write E2 minus E2 1 and be done with it. But typically we want to write this in a nicer order. And then we have to swap these two guys. And remember, if we swap them, we add a minus sign. So we get 1 plus E12. So this by vector, E12, if we square it, that's also an interesting question. Let's see what happens. We just write E12, E12. And then we, we, a good way to do it is actually just write all of the subscripts uh, right here. So you can easily figure out how many swaps you need. And in this case, we, when we swap the two and the one, the two twos will be together. We have to add a minus sign and then the two twos, they will just become plus one and the two ones will also just become plus one. And so we end with minus one. That's kind of interesting. This by vector E12 squares to a negative number. So it's like an imaginary number, except for that there isn't much imaginary about it. This was exactly the E1 times the E2, which were just both positive normal vectors. So we basically get this same power that you get from imaginary numbers without any of the imaginaries, right? All right, let's do this one too. This is a tri vector multiplied with a vector. And again, we just write everything uh, in the same, uh, all the subscripts, all the numbers together so that we can easily figure out the swaps. We swap the one and the three that gives us a minus sign. Then we need to swap the one and the two that takes the minus sign away again. And now we can take the two ones together. That just becomes plus one and we're left with E23, right? And then this last example is just another example to show you that you can get the same by vector from uh, multiplying a whole bunch of uh, different vectors. And so here we are taking the vector E1 plus E2 and the vector E2 minus E1. We're multiplying them together. If you work all of these out, you get this and you end up with the same by vector again, E1, 2. So... With just these two rules, you can basically do all of the calculations. Let us do a few more before I hand over to Martin, who is actually going to work out the entire Kaylee table with you guys, because, well, you'll need this all week. So it pays to, uh, to, to go into a little bit more detail right now. So another example that we'll look at is the geometric product of two three-dimensional vectors. So let's just pretend we're still doing linear algebra. You would write your two vectors like this, two column vectors. V1 has coordinates x1, y1, z1, and V2 has coordinates x2, y2, z2. If we translate this to geometric algebra language, we get V1 is x1, e1, uh, i1, e2, z1, z1, e3, and similar for V2. And what we'll do now is we'll actually calculate that geometric product V1, V2. So if you look here, we, we see that we will get x1, x2, and then 2 times e1, which will just be plus 1. And similarly, we get y1, y2, and z1, z2. So all of these are grouped right here. And then we get the cross terms x1, y2 minus y1, x2, x1, z2 minus z1, x2, and y1, z2 minus z1, y2. So th those are all written here, and those give you these by vector parts, right? And you might actually recognize these uh, blue and green expressions. This part, that's what we typically call the dot product. That's just the dot product between the original vectors V1 and V2. And these expressions actually look strangely familiar also, because those are, of course, exactly the same coefficients ex expressions you would use to calculate the cross product between these two vectors V1 and V2. And so the geometric product really is the sum which comes from these rules, and it really ends up being the sum of this uh, arbitrarily defined dot product and arbitrarily defined cross product that we are used to working with in three dimensions. And that is something that you should notice right away. We're used to working with that in three dimensions because that's the only place where the cross product is actually defined, right? And that's why we typically don't use these names, um, well, at least not this one. So we, we typically use, uh, when we do this in an arbitrary number of dimensions and you take this geometric product between two vectors, there's always going to be the scalar part, which we will call grade zero and which will correspond to the dot product between the two vectors. And then in general uh, number of dimensions, there's always going to be a bivector part also. It's the grade two part because all of the E's have two subscripts. 
And for two vectors, we will call that the wedge product. So the wedge product is going to be the grade two part of the geometric product. The dot product is the grade zero part of the geometric product. And you should also note that when we multiply with the geometric product, two three-dimensional vectors, we get this one scalar part and three bivector parts, and these bivectors all square to minus one, which we just calculated. So that means you have this one real and three imaginary numbers, which just lo looks just like a quaternion, and that's not coincidental, because the geometric product of two three-dimensional vectors is indeed a quaternion. So that leads us to this sort of very famous formula in geometric algebra, which is that the geometric product between two vectors, V1 and V2, is equal to their dot product plus their wedge product. It's very famous, but you need to be careful with it, because this only works if either V1 or V2 or both are vectors. In general, when you take the geometric product between bivector and trivectors and so on, so in general, if you take it between a grade S multivector and a grade T multivector, then your result will have grades going from S minus T to S plus T in steps of two. But the lowest grades and the highest grade parts are often useful and they will always be called the dodge and the wedge products respectively. There's actually even more products that you'll see people using in geometric algebra. There's, for example, the commutator product, but it's also really just the geometric product in a certain combination. And you have the V product, which is really also just the dual of and so on, the geometric product. So it's really all the geometric product. And even though these things are useful and, and they will, uh, when they show up, you will like them. You don't have to be scared of it because really these two rules is all you need to know. That gives you the geometric product and the other products can all be derived from this same geometric product. All right, now it's time for Martin and he'll help you fill in this scaly table for R3. Yeah, because as Steven has mentioned, um, all we need to know are these two simple rules. Uh, so what I would like to do is uh, together we walk through the Cayley table of R3. So that's the multiplication table. So what we first do is we start with our three basis vectors, E1, uh, E2 and E3. And then we will um, compute first the products between them. So for example, if I start with E1 times E1, you find that that is plus one uh, as we expect. And then if you compute uh, E2 times E2 or E3 times E3, uh, unsurprisingly, we get plus one again. But now um, I found a new element, plus one, so I have to add that to my table. And now I can continue multiplying the rest out, so I can take E1 times this E2, and then we find E12. And similarly, you can take uh, E2 times E1, and you get negative E1, 2. And that's indeed because of this uh, anti commutativity So now I can also compute E1 times E3, and that gives me a negative E3, 1. I'll comment more on why we swap the order here in a moment. And we have E2 times E3, and that's E2, 3. And obviously you get the negatives on the other side. So that makes sense. So now we have found three new elements, these three basis vectors, so uh, bivectors, these three new bivectors, so I have to add them to my table. So I write them here again in the uh, headers. And now, um, as I mentioned, we prefer to write E3, 1 instead of 1, 3, and that is just so that it um, agrees with the expected uh, multiplication rules for quaternions. So now I can take E1 times E12, for example, and we just continue uh, filling up our table. So we get E2 from that. Now I can do E1 times E31, and we get negative E3. And now something new is going to happen when I take E1 times E23. And that will be E123. And that's a new element we haven't seen before. So let us add it to our table. And that's actually our pseudo scalar in 3D. And that's the highest grade element we can get. So now we can uh, complete the table. First, all these bivectors, as Steven has also already shown, uh, squared to negative one. So on the diagonal, I get negative one. 
And in fact, this pseudo scalar E123 uh, also squares the negative one. And then by following the same rules, we can fill out this table. And it's very useful to be able to make these tables because now we understand how all the things, uh, all the elements interact with each other. And you can learn a lot by staring at Cayley tables. So I just want to take a brief intermezzo now um, into the space-time algebra because as a physicist, um, this is a really interesting algebra. And also because later in the week, we will have a great talk by Anthony Lazenby. And this is... Uh, a useful background to have to understand his uh, talk. Now, if you're a physicist, a lot of what I'm about to say will look very familiar and be very uh, compelling, I hope. And if you're not a physicist, don't worry, Stephen will be back with some more geometry in a moment. So what is the space-time algebra? First, we take uh, one time-like element, which is going to be a basis element, which squares to plus one. And then we have three space-like dimensions, which square to negative one. And these basis vectors, EI, actually correspond to the Dirac gamma matrices, gamma I, that physicists like to use. So in physics, we always use these matrices. Uh, they're shown here in the standard uh, Dirac representation. Uh, but these actually behave like the basis vectors of space-time. So in GA, we just identify them with our basis vectors E0 up to E3. And there's another interesting set of matrices in physics, and those are the Pauli matrices. So those are denoted with sigma i. I've listed them here. Those are these three matrices, and they play an important role in spin. But they too are just the basis vectors of three-dimensional space. So we can identify them with the basis vectors of space. And the way we will do that is a bit uh, unconventional at first. It's done by something called the space-time split. So we will write sigma i as gamma i times gamma naught. And so in viewed from within the space-time algebra, these sigma i's are actually bivectors. So sigma 1, for example, is the bivector e10. And if you were to stare at the corresponding Cayley table, you would find that this is a bivector that squares to plus one. So it behaves like a basis vector of 3D space. Uh, one last important thing, and that's the pseudoscalar i, which is just the product of all the gammas or of all the Pauli uh, uh, sigma i's. And that's actually the same object, interestingly enough, um, in both space-time or when viewed within the 3D uh, space. And lastly, we have rotors to model the Lorentz group of rotations and boosts. So the key thing of the space-time split is to realize that the even subalgebra of space-time is actually 3D space. And the way to think about that then is uh, gamma naught is a time-like vector and gamma one, for example, is a spatial vector. So that actually sweeps out this bivector. And so that bivector sweeps out through time. And that's why we can use that bivector to represent uh, space itself as it's persistent uh, if, you, if you ignore time. All right. So then um, I want to very quickly go into the, what I think is, is one of the most compelling arguments for STA, and that's the Maxwell equation singular. And that is uh, written as, as such, it's the partial of F is equal to J, where the partial is the gradient operator, and that's a vector. J is the source term, and F is the uh, field strength tensor, which combines the electric and the magnetic fields. And actually, the electric field is uh, a spatial vector. And um, the I here is the pseudoscalar of space-time. And B is, again, a factor in uh, space. So in order to prove now that this actually reproduces the Maxwell equations that we all know and love, we're going to use uh, two things. Uh, first, I need to point out again that because the gradient is a vector, you can split it into the dot part and a wedge part, as, uh, as by the identity that Steven showed. And the dot part is now between a vector and a bivector, so that results in a vector, and that's our source term. Uh, 
and the wedge is just going to be zero because there's nothing on the other hand, which is a, a tri vector. And the other part is the space time split. So we take our source j and we multiply it by gamma naught. And then uh, again, using the same identity, we find that it has a scalar part and a bi vector part. And the scalar part now that we identify with the uh, charge density and the bi vector part we identify with the current. And similarly for the uh, partial derivative operator, the, the gradient operator, uh, its, uh, its divergence is the uh, derivative of respect to time and its curl is the nabla operator in space. And now we can start to work out all the Maxwell equations. So what you do is um, starting from the uh, space-time algebra version, we multiply in a gamma naught on both the left and the right and we just work out the consequences so we uh, work this gamma naught into the partial derivative and we uh, use the identities here above. And we also spell out what f is. And so we get this equation where now we start to see different grades objects appear. And if you go one step further uh, by working out the brackets, then we get this result here. And now you start to see that there are, for example, vector quantities on this side and a vector on that side, so they will probably end up being related. To make the final step, I have to realize that this nabla operator here, again, will split out into a divergence and a curl. So I'll do that. So you see that the uh, nabla acting on E has become a divergence and a curl, again, using the same uh, vector identity of the geometric product. And the same happens for the uh, magnetic fields. And now we can start to collect everything together based on grade. So for example, the simplest one here is that the, uh, the divergence of the electric field uh, is a scalar quantity and I have a scalar on the other side as well, the, uh, the charge density. So those two we take together and I can split that off from the rest. And now I just continue playing the same ga game. So I uh, collect together all the vector parts. Those are these terms. Then I get the bivector parts. And lastly, I have a pseudo scalar part. So remember that, uh, for example, the divergence of the magnetic field is a scalar, but there's an I in front, so that makes it a pseudo scalar. And now we recognize these as the first one is the Gauss law, the second Ampere's law, the third is the Faraday law, and the last is the Gauss law again, but for the magnetic field. So this beautifully reproduces all the known Maxwell equations, but in a single equation. And just to um, bring that point home, that's the most compact form of the Maxwell equations that we know. Um, even in tensor uh, form, which is pretty good, but there you still need two different equations in all these indices. And that can all just be uh, taken together into this one nice uh, equation, grad of F equals J. And with that, I'll just hand you back to Steven for some more geometry. All right, so hopefully that scratched the physicist itch and we can now get back to the graphics and game developers that uh, uh, are in the room. So we've just looked at how SDA can simplify a whole bunch of equation. Uh, and we wonder whether or not we can do the same thing for computer graphics, of course. And for that, we will be talking about a geometric algebra called projective geometric algebra, which uses an extra basis vector, in our case, to model elements at infinity. So that, that'll allow us to treat rotations and translations uh, in exactly the same way, to get exception-free uh, incidents, so uh, join and meet, uh, re-intersections, and, and finding elements that span other elements. It'll give us covariant transformations and much more. We'll go into that in my next talk, actually, in, in a lot more detail. So I just want to give you the general broad overview here. So projective geometric algebra actually comes in three flavors. And we have Felix Klein to thank for that because he realized that all of the classic geometries, flat geometry, spherical geometry, and hyperbolic geometry are really just the same thing if you look at it from the correct point, right? And looking from the correct point is actually going to be quite important. Um, but let's uh, focus on those three algebras. So we have R301. So if you have this extra dimension that squares to zero, then you'll end up having a flat uh, plane or a flat space in, uh, in the case of R301. 
if this extra dimension that you add squares to plus one, you'll end up with a spherical setup. And if it squares to minus one, you'll end up with a hyperbolic setup, okay? So we'll obviously mostly be interested in the flat setup, but actually the formulas that we come up with will work in the two other cases too. So you're getting them for free. Um, that's a lot of equations that you're getting for free, even though we might not be particularly interested in some of those things that you're getting for free. Um, but there's of course much more that PGA can do for you. So there's a lot of formulas that become extremely simple. Composition of any element, geometric element and transformation and all of the other types that, that run around in PGA is just done with a geometric product, right? So just AB. Pretty much the same as the matrix product, but still nice that that's not a property that we lose. We still get that in geometric algebra. But all of the other operators also generalize extremely nicely. For example, a wedge B, which is the operation you see right now, will actually intersect any point line plane volume with any point line plane volume. So you won't need any separate formulas anymore if you want to do a certain type of intersection. Want to intersect two planes, you use the wedge. Want to intersect a line and a plane, you use the wedge, and so on. Similarly, the other operation, the join, will also always work. You want to join two points, you use the V product. You want to join a point and a line into a plane, you use the V product. And the same all the way up to however high you want to go. But things are actually even more spectacular. If you want to project anything on anything, so any point line plane projected on any point line plane, well, that's also just always the same formula. So as far as simplifications go, this uh, little column on the right here literally takes pages and pages of vector algebra equations and simplifies them down to just these four cases. But again, we'll talk about that in a lot more detail in the next talk, which is specifically about this particular algebra. It'll feature other things. In this algebra, all of the transformations are actually modeled as compositions of reflections, and we'll actually be talking a lot about reflections. And the elements are just the invariants of these reflections. Uh, so if you reflect in, in a plane, you leave a plane invariant. If you do it twice, you leave a line invariant and so on. And it turns out to be an extremely natural language to describe the geometry of points, lines and planes and to give you the tools to manip manipulate that on a computer. And actually, it doesn't stop there because this very idea of combining uh, reflections to get to the entire rich world of geometry um, can be extended. And that's exactly what Professor uh, Joan Lazenby will do. She's my favorite professor of all time. And she will be giving a talk where she shows how you can take these mirrors that we use in PGA to create distance preserving transformations and how you can bend them into spheres. So you take this straight mirror and you bend it into a sphere. And that actually gives you the conformal group of angle preserving transformations. And you'll get spheres and circles and point pairs and other exotic objects as natural elements in your algebra. So be sure that you uh, catch that talk also by Joan Lazenby. Good. Time for a recap, right? So what are the important things that we've learned so far? Well, all of these basis vectors are not real numbers and they square to a real number. And if you have two different ones of them, then they anti-commute. Now, this geometric product could be used to define all of these other products. The wedge product was just the highest grade part. The dot product was just the lowest grade part. The commutator is half and so on and so on. So you can define all of these other different products. And I wanted to give some type of a, a mnemonic, something to help you remember all of these properties, but I couldn't really think of anything. So I just have some random letters. The first one is the L for linear, right? So that's very important. All of this is linear and I could have used vector because it's all a vector space, but I really prefer linear space so that you don't just think of arrows. It's everything linear, right? It's also great that all of the elements are combinations of up to n generators. So we don't just have our vectors. We don't just have these oriented lengths, but we also have bi vectors, which were oriented areas. We'll get your tri vectors, which were oriented volumes, quad vectors, which were oriented. I don't even know what that's called and so on and so on. So I'll hope that'll help you remember um, what all of these important things are that you'll need for the rest of the week. And we are now ready to actually get on with some geometry. Be sure to like this video and subscribe because all of the other ones will be released shortly after this one.
Thanks.